So today we're there to discover more about uh, Reactor and a specification we contribute to, which is called Reactive Streams. And we're going to see how that it applied perfectly with microservices. So I'm Stefan Maldini, and I work as a um, customer success organization consultant within Pivotal uh, daytime and nighttime. I'm transforming into a reactor Batman and commit uh, like crazy. And also, uh, one of the things we're going to discuss through reactive streams is uh, something I contribute to and I really enjoy. Uh, the group of people we've working with. So let's start uh, nicely, something quick. Um, what is exactly a microservice? So microservice is, you know, this kind of new buzzword like Agile or um, or Scrum or even Reactive, you know. Uh, and sometimes it has a Good, um, a good background behind that. Sometimes it's just a label renaming. Sometimes it's just something we do, in fact, for years and years. And in the case of microservice, we do that for probably more than 40 years. Um, so microservice, and one of the examples, classic example of microservice is basically a unique chain of commands like cat file. Um, then you get the output of the cat file and you grab it. So you just retain the lines where Doge appears. And then out of these lines, you want to display them completely sorted naturally by, um, by natural order, in fact, alphabetically. And that's a very, uh, a very fine example of microservice. It's not necessarily something uh, which accepts requests, like a server where you put JSON requests Dogecoin.ma, and you do you do have um, this kind of service more and more um, available um, online where you post uh, something to a JSON API, RESTful API, um, and behind this this microservice or this service or this server is going to need more information. Um, it's going to need actually to ping another service to feel uh, any kind of reply is preparing. And because, you know, we are also in the US, uh, sometimes the service does post a kind of message to all friends, for instance, NSA, you know, because everything is CC to NSA in no days. Uh, so, you know, that's a classic kind of example. Um, everyone thinks about when you think about microservice or hexagonal architecture. You think about something, an HTTP server accepting requests, and this one is also posting messages to another list of services, even consuming um, queue messages from a message broker, for instance, or more. So it's not necessarily uniform. And actually, there is a, a very common thing between them, which is nothing about the system itself. It's about the interactions between the systems. And these interactions can be between the service and another service, or can be you and the service, because you are also a kind of system as well. You produce output, you accept input, and sometimes when you consume websites, you do also like to get an output from the website. You don't like uh, having a white page, so you type a request and you want differently uh, a page displayed back. And this boundary is really important, uh, and that's a real deal that makes up distributed architecture, because it is where we spend a lot of effort trying to solve a lot of issues uh, in distributed architecture. So dealing with reality, in fact, uh, dealing with the space and the time, is equivalent to dealing with latency. So we say we, we deal with space and time because it's simply about, uh, you know, really to, check, really to check you have a service hosted on one server, you have another service hosted on another server. There is definitely a space and time separation between them. First, when you send a message, uh, obviously it will have to cross uh, some fiber, optic fiber maybe, doing some I.O. to go from point A to point B. But also, this is not going to be the same time, and this is all about physics. 
So you know the speed of sound, you know the speed, the, the speed of light. It doesn't have the same, um, the same features, the speed of I.O. versus the speed of memory read, for instance. You know these kind of figures. I'm pretty sure everyone has seen these figures uh, showing relative um, access time depending on where you are. And this goes into, falls into the latency issue, the big issue we have to solve when we deal um, with distributed messaging. And you know what? No one's like really wait, waiting. Uh, that's a classic example. So obviously you did, you, I, I hope you did get, I'm not really English from my accent, I'm French. And I took a nice example of French crowd waiting because uh, there is a strike and no one's know where to go. And, and you know, they wait. At some point, people doing that become violent. But on another scale, when you're waiting on a website, you don't really like that, and there is so much competition that you might switch very easily. And also, you know, not everyone likes waiting, but you know what, neither do the machines. Why that? Well, that's a classic example, the pipe and the flow. So you, you know, if you start pouring too much water into your, your, your sink, you, you'll see that at some point it doesn't, uh, well, it just overflow because, because it, there is a time between um, the, the time where the, the water fills uh, the, recipient, the recipient and the water goes out of the sink. And because the pipe is smaller than actually uh, the recipient, which accepts the request, you know, there is the sink and the bottleneck single point of failure sometimes. Um, and maybe if you do that too fast, you overflow, and that doesn't work. So not everyone likes um, waiting too much. So, sorry. So exactly to translate that into concrete term, and that's important when you talk to uh, sometimes your project, product owner, product manager, you know, what exactly is latency doing to them? What is la exactly latency is doing to all of us? Uh, why are we trying to solve that at first? But well, take that as a first class argument, we don't want to lose money. And when people switch sites uh, or application because they bored, they bored by, uh, they bored waiting for a response from a site, or they don't perceive a site as very responsive, um, and that happens, actually studies uh, make sure that they translate the, the waiting time into a shun rate where you start losing users. And some companies have easily uh, do need easily this audience and do easily need to not to make sure that they're not switching because they're waiting. So that's the first class of loose, uh, loss of revenues. Another one, uh, you know, service waiting. Uh, so we're talking mainly about interactions between service, services. Um, if your service is blocked, because he's waiting for another one to uh, reply, you know, you have your user asking a Dodge Money service, something which is blocked, waiting for another service, filling the profile as the first example showed. Uh, you know, another user can connect to the same site uh, and say, okay, I'm going also to request something, and he's going to, the, the site itself is going to ask again a, a profile site to fill a response. So, yes, there are obviously uh, ways to, to go around that, but that's not very efficient. Why that? The first thing you will think about is scaling the number of threads eventually, because you're going to say, okay, I'm going to assign a thread per request, but thinking about reality, does it really scale that much? Can you scale the number of threads with the number of users you have? So at this stage, you will think about scaling out. And scaling out is, a, in fact, the first point where you start losing revenues. When you start scaling out on platforms such as Classic, you know, Amazon, um, well, it costs very, very real money to you. And because you have a, an application not designed at first for distributed architecture, um, maybe you do need more. It's not the end of the world, but fixing that after is going to cost you much, much more money that, than designing that before uh, as you know, classic pattern in life. Uh, if it's better to anticipate these kind of issues than uh, trying to solve afterwards. It's generally expensive when you do that after. So
So one of the possible answer to, to this main issue um, is reactive programming, which is a kind of other buzzword as well. Uh, but this one comes with some technical evidence and in fact do reliable uh, practices already existing, already existing for years. So reactive programming is a possible, not the only one answer to this issue. And obviously, if you think about the name, the reactor itself, um, well, obviously there is a kind of connection between reactive programming and reactor. So reactor is just a, a reactive programming framework for the GVM, Java, and more. Uh, and we, 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 we tend to think about more, in fact, so we're not constrained by the GVM, but right now um, we implement a lot of things with the GVM. JavaScript will be a target as a side note. So what, what exactly is uh, reactive programming? You probably, maybe, if you're interested in that space, you probably have seen uh, things like reactive manifesto, and that explains quite well um, in fact, what is reactive programming. So I've um, taken what is presented in reactive manifesto, which I strongly encourage you to have a read on. Um, so what is reactive programming is, in fact, if we can just change name, and that makes much more sense to uh, experienced developers as you, um, you should label it even driven programming, for instance. Uh, it works quite nice. And what does even drive an architecture to you? Well, even drive an architecture introduces a level of end direction um, we call usually even bus, where you send a message and people or uh, services interested into this message will listen to this even bus, not directly to the service producing the message. This level of end direction allows you to do fault tolerance, to achieve fault tolerance, for instance. Why that? Because simply if one of the services fail and you can duplicate them and it's cheap to duplicate inside um, within the JVM application services or threads um, to a point, of course, rather than restarting your application because you have to, to change your load balancer, for instance, uh, setting to say, okay, I have 10 applications or 10 consumers, you can just say, okay, I'm just sending a message to you um, an event bus and any number of applications listening for these messages uh, will be able to respond. And if any of them is failing, well, for instance, I have a few other ones ready to accept the messages. So it's not the end of the world. You don't have to restart. And the other nice property of this level of indirection is you have this elasticity feature. Um, elasticity as scaling features. In fact, you can transparently for your producer add more resources, more consumers consuming your message produced by any kind of application. Or if you need to save some resources, you can dynamically scale down and uh, remove some of these resources you've, you've started consuming. And that works within the GVM, adding more consumer, with, which means adding more threads uh, processing your, your messages. And that also works outside the GVM, which is scaling out or scaling horizontally. And you add more of the service um, in different hosts, if, if possible, and, and you load balance between them. And the load balancing is, in fact, the event bus. And two of these two traits, in fact, lead to the old grail of responsive application, because if you're not long to restart, if you can adapt to the to, to currently the demand, um, the, the peak bar, the peak load you have on your site, dynamically without redesigning or without uh, restarting, if you do have for the elasticity in particular a boundary that says, okay, I'm consuming the messages in a different thread than the original one which produced the message, you do achieve a nice and perceived low latency or responsiveness. I make a white call because we're not talking about real-time and embedded programming here. We're talking about the perceived latency for a user. How long before the request comes back to the user? How long before another user can start using the site? 
uh, is connecting to. And that is all about, can I leave the message to delegating the responsibility? Can I leave the message to some uh, other resource so I can go back directly to the user without waiting? Um, unfortunately, it's not that easy to implement, and that's why we come to um, provide for you Reactor as well. So a reactive architecture is all about this modularity and bulk heating. You know, also another interesting fact, um, when you, you start using um, event-driven architecture, you start having uh, such a decoupling that you even can you can even decouple your uh, life cycle between application development. So you have a, you will have a consumer dedicated to consuming processing uh, order processing, for instance, and another consumer will be able to uh, consume, for instance, um, new user registrations, and they can have different life cycle be deployed separately. Um, so that's quite interesting for. Uh, also for the moderate the modularity of, of uh, your software architecture in, in fact reactors try to solve a lot of issues uh, as a few issues but the main goal to if you had to retain one thing about reactor one thing it tries to do for you one problem it tries to solve it's latency how to design an application which you know in advance that will need to be um, adapted to uh, cope with latency, which is the case for a lot of applications nowadays. We're going to a full hexagonal architecture year, a full microservice year in 2015. Everyone is betting on that. And for some reason, sometimes or for they're going overbroad, but they're not going to be, um, you know, um, there are some sometimes overuse of an hexagonal architecture. Not everything has to be um, an exploded distributed architecture, but and some application would better have a monolith rather than a, a microservice architecture. But for those guys who design distributed architecture, that's exactly the problem Reactor tries to address. So what is make what does make Reactor Reactor? Uh, we have a first bunch uh, of components we call asynchronous or synchronous dispatchers. Um, they can be, in fact, both. We can switch between asynchronous dispatcher and asynchronous dispatcher. And what is a dispatcher? Well, it dispatches messages, as the name suggests, and it would be very close in terms of role uh, to a thread, thread pool executor, for instance, but much smarter. Uh, in a sense, we don't say Java as a dumb threading mechanism. They have a lot of awesome mechanism, and that's why the JVM makes it um, one of the perfect platform to implement um, multi, uh, multi core or dis um, parallel applications because the threading coming with J the JVM is such complete. The problem is more about the complexity. To implement, to implement some of the parallelism um, patterns, you, you have to, well, it's very hard. It's like security, in fact. You don't want to implement it yourself. That's one of the best advices um, around parallel programming. Don't implement parallelism yourself. Try to delegate to uh, a framework uh, of your trust. So dispatchers are mainly having this role of managing the message passing between thread A and B. And they, in fact, pour two main components, which we call reactor as the uh, eponym name, in fact, as the, the, the framework name, which is, in fact, an event bus. You can notify and you can, um, you can listen for uh, a reactor bus, uh, which, is, which consists, in fact, of addresses we call selector, where you say, OK, I can notify this specific string, this specific URI, or whatever, because we have a lot of different selectors. And from the consumer side, you will say, OK, I'm going to listen for this specific selector, and I'm going to, um, to capture any event coming into this, uh, matching this event selector. So this is the kind of decoupling we were talking about uh, in event-driven programming. So what does fit the stream and promises inside that? Well, it's very close to the event bus. It's just more type-checked with a more stronger type um, um, 
so, sorry, a tight control between the, the producer and the subscriber. And that does offer you very interesting new possibilities such as handling back pressure. We'll see that in a minute. So both of them, uh, the stream and the promise, uh, which are in fact the same thing. Uh, promise is just a subcategory of stream. A stream is just a kind of um, consumer which can chain or stage processing and have multiple steps, in fact, be in between an event received and the end of this pipeline chain, for instance. A promise will be a subset of that, will just accept one event at most and will finish. Um, so that's why we, we place them um, together. It's like a type checked one event uh, consumer. So both of these uh, components do actually use what we call um, function, the functional artifact. The first uh, very important part is single abstract method component, which are basically interfaces with only one method to implement. So that's, that makes it uh, quite more easy to implement anonymous classes, or if we talk about Java 8 or Groovy or Scala, uh, implementing Clojure or Lambda, uh, because you know, if you have to chain in a programming uh, model, if you have to chain uh, computation, um, you don't want to have that super verbose with the anonymous class uh, declaration filling your screen. Um, actually, the lambda and the functions and the closure are really, really good fit for uh, stream and promises. Then we have tuple and timer. Tuples are like uh, type check CSV lines. So uh, it's an array with an exact type for each column. Um, timers, you know, uh, our timers, you can schedule any kind of task, and that's quite useful for timed operation in streams, and also for scheduling tasks on an event bus. And once you, we have this nice tree called tree on the left, we can talk about these two uh, aside utils packages, but not that utils in a in a negative in a negative sense, in fact, utils because they come to complete uh, as much as you need it. If you don't need any of that, you don't have to use them. It's not an issue. They're just independent uh, legal brick you, you can add to your um, own React application. So, what does it consist of? The first family is fast IO because we deal. Um, we also deal with distributed boundaries. At some point, if we deal with distributed boundaries, that means we will have some I.O. access to, uh, to query a, a distant service, a remote service. So for this reason, we have a few interesting utils like um, buffering, um, net, uh, which consists of TCP server and client, and also UDP server, and zero MQ server, etc. So a suite of I.O. driver, basically. Uh, persistent queues based on Java Chronicle, uh, which means basically uh, direct memory mapping to the file system, a very, very fast file system access, in fact, um, implemented by Java Chronicle. It's an optional dependency, so you don't have to use it, but if you use it, you just pull uh, Java Chronicle as well, and you have all these nice tools around that. And codec, because when you do I.O., you you, you do need a kind of codec. You, you do need serialization at some point, um, line feed or whatever, but you, you do need a kind of message protocol to um, hydrate messages or de dehydrate messages. And fast data part, the fast data for me, is all about improving to uh, micro uh, benchmark ready uh, scale all your critical paths. So for this reason, we have allocators, which consist of, um, in fact, pre-allocating in memory envelopes, such as event object. So, you know, when you pass messages around, you often use an envelope, for instance, the event type, the event object. And the event has headers and payload, for instance. Instead of creating this new envelope every time you have a new message, there are, there are tools to allow you to pre-allocate these messages because when you're dealing with millions of messages per second, uh, roughly the allocation is not that 
an issue, you can the JVM can scale to allocate a lot, lot, lot of objects per second, so a lot of these event envelopes. Uh, but the issue comes, in fact, with the garbage collection, and and when it's time to pay back what you've allocated, you don't want to be there. In fact, you want to 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 run away because it's going to be a pause, a micro pause or a long pause, but it's going to cost you some time and reduce performance through your critical path. So if you have a, this kind of critical path, if you're dealing with a lot of messages per second, it's better to try to pre-allocate and reuse these envelopes as soon as you can. And in the same uh, way, we have also batch processor, which do uh, batch allocation of uh, events uh, at one time. It's a kind of complicated, and in fact, sometimes the stream, um, the stream API comes with simpler solution, and we try over time to back um, these nice patterns within stream as well. So, what is a stream exactly? A stream is simply a pipeline you declare. Um, you can use streams. Uh, in fact, there is a, a slight mistake you need to amend. Um, it's in the Rx package. You can use a streams. And there is a differ, uh, as there is a lot of um, factory method, in fact, static method that generates a stream for you. Differ, for instance, is just a kind of stream that can be dynamically called anytime using a method called broadcast. And anytime this method, uh, anytime the stream is called, um, actually the stream itself is going to be triggered. So what is a stream in a sense? It's a kind of it's a kind of sequences of steps, of stages, uh, where your event is going to go through. Um, so the first one in that case is going to be a transformation. Map means transformation uh, in not all case. So we're going to map a first incoming message, uh, any kind of message, and we're going to create and return as a, produce, as a product of this stage a tuple of name as a first column. Remember, tuple is a CSV type check line. And so will as a string character um, as a second colon. So we're going to return a tuple of two columns after the first stage. Then a second stage kicks in. And this one also creates a CSV line tuple with as a first column um, the name of the previous produced uh, result and as a second column the concatenation of something coming from uh, the previous result and adding much size. And then at last, you have a terminal callback consuming every event coming in until until completion. So another particularity of streams, uh, they can complete. Actually, you can use a stream dot uh, broadcast complete, and then automatically it will clean out every resources and consume will never consume anything else, even if you keep using stream dot broadcast next. If you have used the broadcast complete, it's finished. So actually, streams also do have the particularity to uh, end eventually. So once we understand simply to, to once we we put in mind that the stream is simply a pipeline, um, things get easier to explain afterwards. Why do you use a stream? Um, so we can create this pipeline, this embedded data processing that's correct. But the main use cases people uh, tend to uh, highlight when they use streams uh, are, in fact, metric statistics, micro-batching, and hero, hero handling. So why that? Mero, um, hero handling, mainly because streams allow you, allows you to um, deal with failures gracefully. They have a lot of operations to deal with failures, like retry, resume on hero, um, uh, fail fast with a circuit breaker, for instance, um, return a default value if there is an error. This kind of uh, logic uh, can be easily implemented, and that's one of the best aspects I find in, in the streaming API. Um, but there is also a strong correlation between metric statistics and micro-batching, because both of them are possible thanks to the aggregation operations. And stream safe API usually come with nice uh, suite of aggregation, aggregating operations, such as creating array of 100 elements or creating array over 
100 elements and over one second window. So if we received 100 elements or if one second elapsed, actually I'm creating a new payload and I'm sending that to downstream to my next uh, consumer. So these kind of uh, patterns are really applying uh, for metric statistics and micro-batching because for metric statistics you will do, I'm going to collect um, events for 100 or one second and I'm going to accumulate these counters using the reduce operation uh, for this 100 element or one second window. And that's the metric statistic case because you're going to sample values over time every x, x number of elements um, and you're going to send this specific pipeline of metrics to, um, for instance, a dashboard and, you know, this kind of um, end-user application, dashboard, uh, monitoring tool, et cetera, et cetera. So metric statistics for the reducing aggregation and micro-batching, obviously, because when you create payload of 100 elements, um, you can save some I.O. cost because you're not going to send element maybe in your subscriber to your database, uh, element by element, but you're going to do that one of the element by one of the element, classic batching. So defining a stream is simply a matter of exactly uh, it doesn't uh, what it is in fact exactly. It's just a sequence of data and sequence of staging API um, doing something with every event coming in. So a stream is strongly about uh, the data coming in, uh, and there are two kind of flavors we'll see. It's strongly about the API, the processing API, um, and certainly it's not, it's not in the case of the streams we're talking about, a collection or storage. So for instance, in Java 8, uh, they do sometimes consider um, a stream as also a storage. You convert your uh, collection or array into a stream, and that is actually a kind of collection. Every time you're going to attach um, an operation, it's, it's going to be uh, executed, for instance, some or this kind of operation, or map int, et cetera, et cetera. So what, um, what do we do usually with streams? Uh, in fact, there is one slide you need to remember, if you can. This is this slide. Uh, the rest. You don't really need to, uh, to 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 keep that in mind, but this one is what is actually the, trans the what is the transformation actually happening. So we have a service, and this service is a classic user service. Uh, it has an authenticate user method, accepting a long ID, throwing exception, which is a first uh, warning, and this apparently there's a return uh, on the user dot find by id and you can guess it's maybe um, spring data or uh, a gorm a grace gorm uh, call for instance it's going to call a database behind so io so there are m multiple issues with that the first one is the bubbling of the accept exception which is good and not really really good in a in a very disrupted architecture why that so what, what happens when there is a failure, when your database call fails? Well, um, obviously there will be an exception building up, and if you have a user controller calling this service, it will have to catch the exception and do, and do something about that. But to know about this exception, you need to block, you need, you need to really execute this user find dot, sorry, this user dot find by ID um, in the same thread where you started the um, user service authenticate user if you want to bubble up the exception. And that's not good because that means you're blocking your producer. Another hint about that is the return type. User is a type fully hydrated of exactly the entity you fetched in the database. And if you do that, that means you really have a user coming from your database. So you did the I.O. call in the same thread of the producer calling authenticate user. And that's not very good because that is what we try to avoid. We try really try to avoid any kind of this in the critical path. What we try to do is slightly different, but if you think about it, it's not really that different. Because instead of returning the user, 
and throwing an exception, we're going to wrap that in a missing type uh, in the JVM, which we call stream in all case. In fact, in the DVM, we, in Java 8, I think there is an option to use optional. In functional programming, they do a lot of optional as well. But what the advantage of streams over this, um, over directly over a user return directly? Well, first, you don't have, you don't necessarily have to know in advance if you're going to scale up or down um, the stream or the request to the database because if I want to add okay, I'm going to, to dispatch actually on a different thread. After dot .create, I can use dot .dispatch on and say, I'm going to, to use this thread, or I'm going to use 10 threads, I'm going to partition the, the demand, or this kind of thing. Actually, it's totally transparent to the producer. The producer still call authenticate user. It still have a stream uh, of user returned from that. And, you know, a stream doesn't mean a sequence of n data it can be also one data, like a promise. A promise is one data. And if you have this case, and there is a slight typo on the home complete, if you have this case, you can just one, you can just on next, which means every time I create a stream, I'm going to be provided with an object which we call um, a subscriber. And this subscriber is actually the next element in my stage chain in my pipeline. What I'm going to do every time someone subscribes to me. I'm going to call on next with the result of the user found by ID. And this is protected because it happens within the create operation. And the create operation can be dispatched asynchronously if I want. And I don't care, in fact, uh, to return a, a real user directly because I'm going to consume this user like the map before. I'm going to consume it after saying, for instance, authenticate user, this ID, dot map, dot blah, 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 dot blah, 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 dot consume, and that's it. I'm not, I'm not waiting or blocking for the return of the database. I'm not going to do a future.get, which is the blocking call we want to avoid. And even if there, are, there is only one element, doesn't care. we don't care because we send just on complete and we finished. So you can think about stream bus event bus. Um, just, you know, there are both kind of uh, patterns to create this level of indirection uh, between a producer and uh, a consumer to scale uh, as an orthogonal issue to deal with latency uh, directly by consuming when it is ready not and not blocking the producer. So they both feel kind of same uh, niches in, in that case. But in fact, one is going to have limitation and the other one is going to also have limitation, fair enough. Um, so one is going to be a type check flow where uh, the stream is going to be a type check flow, in fact, because we use a lot of invariants, convariants, generics, uh, and all Java assistance we can to give the user, the developer, uh, hints about even going through the pipeline. In the case of a fully decoupled event bus, unfortunately, you will have to have a codec uh, mapping because you're not sure about the event coming through uh, to your topic, for instance, you're listening to. Uh, and that may be an issue or not, but sometimes people prefer to have control over um, over the pipeline. Another interesting thing is publisher subscriber in stream is a very tight uh, control. So you con you start consuming, which is the equivalent to start reading, uh, when you think you're ready, when you have subscribed all your pipeline, for instance, um, or on some kind of occurrence on the schedule uh, scheduler. Um, um, a scheduled, scheduled task, in fact, a scheduled job, or whatever. In fact, you have the opportunity to control exactly when you start reading the event and when you start stopping reading the event. So that's another use case for streams. And also streams don't support concurrency because we have to handle um, signal in, uh, in order. So if you send two next signal and then a complete signal, we make sure from point A head of the stream to point B, terminal callback of your stream, that they will arrive, um, unless you use specific operation, they will arrive in order. And that's very, very, very important. Uh, it's, it's specified by specification. And if we didn't have that, we couldn't understand all the framework implementations. So rule of thumb, 
If nested even composition greater than two, switch to stream, which is uh, what JavaScript developer will call the callback hell. If you have too many nested compositions, if you have um, a consumer listening to user register topic, and then it sends an event to uh, send mail topic, which then sends another event to uh, distribution send, you know, there are three levels of composition in this eventing. And that starts being hard to read. It doesn't seem so when I talk, uh, but actually implementing it, it becomes quickly a spaghetti plate. So the two kind of flavor I was talking earlier about uh, are hot stream and cold stream. Hot stream are directly, um, are in fact, a direct event, real-time event you can't control. For instance, one of the real uh, applied in real-world use case for streams is to in video gaming. In game, in, sorry, in video gaming. So video game developers use um, streams uh, for, for instance, filtering or aggregating mouse clicks. And you don't control when mouse click comes until you uh, you start aggregating them, for instance, which actually transform that into a call stream. But you don't control when your user is going to click or type or something. So that's actually a, a hot stream, real time, and by nature, uh, not replayable uh, event. Unless you start using a call stream or transform it into a call stream, which is something you can replay. For instance, an array, a file. Um, you know, you can start reading from the very beginning of a file every time you consume your stream. It doesn't. It's not a problem because you still have this file physically here, where the event has been produced at a t at time t, and that's it. On in an off-stream case. And in a sense, if you start looking at what is it in, uh, in Reactor, it's simply, for instance, if you take the just operation, uh, it simply takes a list, a list of elements up to eight arguments. After you will lift, you will have to use um, an OS operation to accept an iterable. Uh, but stream.just will take five elements, and every time you consume this stream, it's going to create five elements. Minus the fact that there is a take-free operation in the middle, so that means it will complete slightly before the end as a free element, so element free. And we also have an example for MGP upstream, for instance, um, which we are really developing now. And if you want, if you start consuming um, MQP or RabbitMQ Q, you can pass a Q to Latin streams. And any event will occur uh, independently of the of the will of the subscriber in that case. So you subscribe and you, you will see event from the time t where you start to just subscribe. And there is also a timeout operation and dispatch operation. So dispatch on actually assign a very different dispatcher if you want to assign a specific set of thread uh, from a specific set of thread. Dispatch on is specifically what you need. Uh, by default, it's going to be synchronous or going to happen on the same thread consuming from RabbitMQ. But in that case, I make sure that I use one of the fast dispatcher uh, available within Reactor. And timeout 30, by default 30 seconds, is going to say, if I haven't received anything for 30 seconds, I just complete. And in fact, I complete with a error state, which is a timeout exception. So 30 seconds is not from the very beginning, it's the distance the time between two consecutive events. So every time there is a new event, it will reset the timeout. So that one is coming next. It's in it's hosted in reactor slash uh, reactor dash mqp on GitHub, um, and all of that to um, come back to the reactive stream specification. So. Why do we have a specification, um, and what does it define? It defines simply, it defines uh, what exactly I've told you until now. It, it, it makes a specification around that. It's an async non-blocking data sequence because we don't want to block the producer. It's a protocol to talk between a producer and subscriber, no matter the resource they have been assigned. Um, it's 
embeddable. So you've seen uh, I create stream relatively easily, uh, not uh, not a lot of XML configuration. It also doesn't include, it doesn't involve a lot of memory use or CPU use until you start really uh, flowing events in it. And the main different factor is the purple box, which is the async non-blocking flow control. Let me explain. So usually you have a publisher, uh, which is a real name given in the specification, and a subscriber, which is going to consume events uh, coming from the publisher. But the difference with the specification is we have defined a contract to ask a publisher more elements to signal the publisher, I, I am ready to accept more elements. So this is a bidirectional flow specified, and that's very interesting. Why that? Because if the subscriber is too slow picking up the demand, automatically the publisher is going to uh, switch to a slow mode um, and put, putting the uh, event into a slow queue, but a robust queue and something that you can replace safely. And if it's, too, if it's not slow, if it's fast, which means the, public, the subscriber is keeping asking for more elements every time, or eventually use the magic number, which is long max, meaning I'm ready to accept every element, um, actually I'm going to just push to the publisher, uh, to the subscriber every time. So it's a kind of reactive chain, uh, shift between pull and push for, from the subscriber perspective, and that's the game changer. And if a lot of people implement that, as we start having uh, more and more implementation, well, we can think about having an end-to-end -end flow from database to, I don't know, WebSocket client, thinking about that. Um, and if you have a subscriber signaling how fast uh, it can consume, you know, like in that case, you have a WebSocket client, and for instance, the other client is a regular task pulling um, from this same publisher, the same source of events. Uh, yes, maybe one is going to be slower, but it doesn't impact the other one, at least for a certain amount of time, or depending if you use um, specific facilities for that. But the slow queue is going to be used only by the slow subscriber. But the, the, the WebSocket subscriber, for instance, is, is never going to be impacted by uh, this slow queue until you know you fill your memory and that's going to become an impact. That's why I say it's called cool for a limited amount of time, but still. So the sequence signal of signals is simple. You can, when you subscribe to a publisher in the specification, you can either receive on error, or you can directly start receiving the necessary sequence, which is first unsubscribe and then zero to end on next element, which is really the event going through. And maybe eventually we we'll finish by error or complete. And that's the last signal you can receive, no more on next after that. Who's going to walk behind the specific, who has walked behind the specification? Well, all the guys interested massively into real-time space, I would say, uh, TypeSafe, Netflix, uh, are really strong proponents of these technologies. Also, Dupli from uh, behind the, a lot of thread facilities, thread, um, threading facilities within the JVM is uh, collaborating with us, uh, and that uh, actually gives us a lot of hopes about uh, possible integration in the JDK. And what's the point about joining? Why do these people, why do we talk each other, uh, sometimes as competitors, you know? Uh, because if we solve the issue end to end, if we have this kind of nice story, a reactor data driver talking, because we're good at that, we have a lot of data integration within the Spring ecosystem, talking to a distributed system based on ACA, they have a dynamo implementation, very interesting implementation. Talking to um, Arec Java, the Netflix framework for reactive extensions, um, which has a nice ecosystem around metrics and pipelines, for instance, Eastrix. Uh, and then we talk to Ratpack, which is a nice new player for uh, asynchronous uh, web server, which understands already the streaming specification. That means understanding the interface and the TCK we have implemented. Well, all these guys, communicate together either event and back pressure if Rackpack is too busy to, to, 
to read more events, it won't signal daemon to Akka, which in return, if it's too busy dispatching event, not going to ask for more event to react to that day driver, and so on. So technically, if you look at that in code, it does work. Well, I came from TypeSight did this nice example, and you can see in the five, in four different, um, in, in these four different squares, the four different technologies at play. The purple one with RxJava creating from a list of ints an observable, and then transforming into a publisher. Aka streams creating from this publisher a source, as they call it, and mapping into two strings, and then creating another publisher ready to be consumed. Reactor, which I hope is simpler to read because it's on one line at least, is taking the uh, output of Akka and mapping it, adding line feed in the end, and then send that. Is being this stream is going to be consumed by Ratpack, which is the orange box. And actually, Ratpack allows you to stream to to stream chunk HTTP chunk to to the client. And, and since we have a line feed, that's quite cool. Uh, we consume directly the the reply of all stream. So see, this interaction is really working nowadays, and it's quite simple. It's a, you know, it's a single document uh, on GitHub. It has four interfaces, and the most important part, it has a TCK. It's uh, the three interfaces plus one are really, really simple to read. The first publisher, you subscribe to subscriber. That's why I can't signal on next, on new, on subscriber, on complete from a publisher side. You remember the stream.create, that's what I did. The subscriber has these four kind of events. The interesting part is subscription, which is received when you subscribe to a, to a publisher. And this subscription is the component. You can say, okay, that's the way, the link back to the publisher. Okay, I'm ready to accept more events. I'm, I'm going to accept everything and cancel if you stop, if you're not interested anymore. Processor is the staging uh, part implementing both subscriber and publisher, doing nothing else, and being both output and input in that side. And you know, uh, streams implement publisher uh, directly, natively. Processor implement subscriber and um, and publisher. Sorry, and an action in reactive uh, in Reactor, Sorry, is not necessarily exposed to the user, but whenever you call dot map dot buffer dot reduce all these operations coming off a stream API, the stream API, they actually create what we call action, and then therefore create processor accepting input and producing output. And Promise is also a kind of processor because it can accept an input, you can block on this, on this input, or remember only one input in the case of a Promise, but eventually if you want to keep you know, co combining things or uh, computing, you can still add more operations. So that's why it's also creating an output. But, you know, um, sorry. if we add a Java, um, if you do have Reactor as well, why do you, have, do you have another implementation of reactive extensions, for instance? And it's true we have a line on naming, like just flat map, retry map, etc., etc. It's true most of the Rx pattern apply to Reactor streams. It's true it's also lightweight and available, but omission is mainly focused on throughput, um, and all the functional facilities. So we have to make some trade-offs sometimes, less flexibility. We have a mission to integrate correctly with all our family, Spring IO, uh, Revit, Redis, Cloud Foundry, Gemfire. So a lot of people interested, uh, a lot of things to stream or to consume. Uh, and I think another very interesting point is we do have native implementation, so a stream is really already a publisher, so you don't need to have a bridge, which is a case of Rx Java, for instance, you have to pull a different dependency to transform an observable into a um, publisher. Actually, all operations are native reactive streams implementation in Reactor that makes them easier to communicate with all the implementation, for instance. So, to finish, um, I think I'm going to just expose a few patterns and then we can start the, uh, the uh, Q&A. So first of all, and this one is not going to take a lot of time, don't do that. Don't cut your, uh, don't make a boundary between each, uh, each operation unless you really, really have a need for that. 
Why that? So you see, you remember, we can dispatch, we can use dispatch on to assign a dispatcher to the current stream. But if you if you change this dispatch on, actually for each different operation, you will have a different thread, for instance, assigned to a different operation, and that's not good because it's cool to to go asynchronous, but it comes at a price. It comes at a price, and the cost, the context switching is not that. Um, free. So you don't want to do that every time if you can. In that case, I don't think it will be very useful. Um, in that case, it will be more useful because, you know, it's um, an incoming HTTP stream doing some operation, for instance, mapping the request to JSON, filtering if the JSON is not correct. And then on a different thread, we consume and maybe reply back to the original request. And that's better. But if any of the map and filter operations are blocking, well, the HTTP request stream, stream is going to be blocked as well. So, you know, if it's an HTTP request stream reading off NIO uh, as an NIO server, reading off a few threads, if you block one of them, you may be losing 25% 25, 25 of your capacities. You don't want to do that. And this one is better because of the reading request stream, you just switch to another different dispatcher and that protects your reading from being blocked. So you can accept more requests. Cool. Same for flat map. I'm not going to dive in too much detail. I'm just going to show you what is exactly flat map in two words. Flat map is just a synonym for sub pipeline, sub flow, whatever. Um, so in that case, we create a sample pipeline as stream .just Doge, so a pipeline that will just emit Doge, and flat map operation, as soon as it receives Doge, is going to create dynamically a new pipeline only for this Doge. So we, we see that inside the closure, we, I'm just creating dynamically a new stream. And the consume operation in the end is going to consume the merge result of this created flow, subflow, in fact. So that's mainly a fork join, very close to that, um, or you know, gateway, uh, if you think about integration patterns, or this kind of thing, without the blocking part, of course. So flat map is just map and merge, nothing more. Also, we do have, uh, very important, I talked about uh, the signal concurrency. What, how do you scale if you can't uh, send more than one event at a time to a staging operation? Well, you have operations like group by and partition, which are actually going to create a clone of your streams. So what does it mean? Partition 8 is going to say, I'm going to try the next operation eight times, passing it a root stream, where I'm going to dispatch uh, incoming event. So actually, I'm going to have eight times executed dispatch on map, release, and consume. And every time a new event comes to dot partition, which is the first level operation, it's going to be dispatched on one of these uh, stream, pre-created streams, which in the end is concurrency. So that's mainly it for the main, uh, the, the main patterns. We do have also all the interesting patterns such as um, decoupling the uh, request dispatcher and the consuming dispatcher. Sometimes you want to do that. For instance, we have an operation called stream.range, and in that case, it's going to um, you know, emit every, every single integer until the integer max value. You, you don't want to do that um, necessarily in the same thread that you're consuming these events, because you're going to be blocked until all events are going to be read, et cetera, et cetera. So, a way to do that is to say, I'm going to ask the next element on a different thread than the one I'm going to use to dispatch. That's why I'm doing with requests on. Every time I'm accepting a request, I'm going to use the master dispatcher, but when I dispatch on, I'm going to use um, a different one because I want to execute the request which executes every integer dispatching into a specific thread, and I want to dispatch on another one uh, to you know to to take the result of sample operation and sample over two seconds is the last result the last emitted item for the last two seconds. So so just to conclude, I'm not going to um, 
to implement to show you the implementation of the um, uh, circuit breaker pattern because it might be a bit advanced for a, a quick introduction. But to conclude, what we do offer uh, is not unique. We are multiple implementing the specification, and that's a good sign. Uh, so reactor 2.1.0.0.M1 is implementing, uh, sorry, not 1.0.0.M1, but 0.4.0, like the other one. Actually, M2 is implementing uh, 0.0.M1. And same for ARCA streams, uh, same for RX Java and RATPAC. So that makes four very interesting frameworks to play with, and I really encourage you to be very hands-on and just play with any of them. See how interesting it is to to, um, to start migrating from a mindset where you return events, um, sorry, object entities directly to a mindset where you stream things. Can be one result, can be 10 results, doesn't really matter. And there are a few entry posts. The best documentation so far, in my opinion, is Rx Java. It explains very, very well all these operations we implement. Also, uh, reactive-streams.org, which is obviously um, the site for the specification, hosting the specification, uh, with the driver behind why we did, um, between all these companies, we did want to, to do this industrial standard. And the reactive streams is also hosted on GitHub, which is quite interesting because you can ask questions, you can collaborate, you can fix issues. In fact, it's not meant to be all as a group of companies or specification. And that's the difference with a GCP, for instance. It, it, we want that to be open and completely collaborative with anyone putting issues, etc., proposing changes. Obviously, it's a specification, so it doesn't have to change every time. But, you know, we discuss a lot about the definitions, and definition matters in, in specification, so if you find it not enough self-explanatory, for instance, uh, needs to change the phrasing, that's the kind of thing we discuss a lot, you know, in a specification. Also, um, we close to release 100M2. Uh, actually, I should check after this call if I have to do that, because uh, they were waiting on uh, a merge request. And so, you know, before uh, going final, we need to make sure we have concrete example, uh, updated documentation, because the uh, current reactive streams.org is maybe not enough um, to explain all these patterns. Uh, we discussed integration within the JDK9, not done yet. Uh, it's still a JDK discussion we're talking about. Uh, so here we come. And Reactor, uh, it, resources, and in my opinion, one of the most interesting over the last uh, couple of months, probably, is this uh, blog post introducing what we've done so far with M1. In fact, I think it was, uh, yeah, last um, two months ago, in October, the day of my birthday, actually. So if we do have, um, we do have some of these resources of label, we do miss a few documentary uh, elements, I must confess, and we're working strongly on that. We're working uh, on our roadmap, and actually we have an increasing demand uh, for the framework, so that also gives us some flexibility and maybe, um, you know, growing the framework, etc. So, Q&A time. All right. Um, Sur Surya Veer asks, uh, can you describe a little bit more about how fault tolerance can help in low latency? And there was another similar question from Anish saying, what specifically has been done for fault tolerance as a reactor? What are the mechanisms to handle faults considering the async nature of the processing? So kind of, I think the same answer will probably get you both of those questions. Right. So, fault tolerancy, um, why, do, why does it affect latency? Well, um, I, I don't know if I, I made it that. I think it, it wasn't clear, but um, when you do not have to restore an entire system because you didn't cascade failures, it makes it more, uh, more reactive for the end user. You know, the passive latency, low latency was w with a Y call, doesn't mean you will uh, we will process more requests by second. It means that the user will have a perception of a continuity of service in that case. So low latency uh, is linked to fault tolerance in, in that sense that you don't, you, you, you protect yourself, you design for failure, you design in advance for failure instead of designing afterwards or coping with that as an exception, you design it as a possible rule uh, happening 
for you. And you know, things like Chaos Monkeys, as uh, advertised by Netflix, for instance, are really that and working fine with this kind of architecture because Chaos Monkeys are script um, randomly in production killing one of your uh, applications. And that's why you see how, how long it would take for you to recover from uh, such a failure. If your failure was cascading to all the services, you will have to restart, etc. That's slow for the user. That's uh, not continuity of service. So that's mainly for this reason we talk about bulk killing and not cascading failures. I uh, don't know if that answers the question one. If you can tell me the question two again. Sure, no problem. Um, it was what specifically has been done for fault tolerance in Reactor? What are the mechanisms to handle faults considering the async nature of the processing? Right. So what happens when you return? Uh, actually, I'm going to show this slide. And that's a good question. Oops. Ah, animations. So that's exactly what happens when you do a circuit breaker with a stream, for instance. That's one of the possibilities you can uh, actually uh, implement with Reactor. So basically, we have operations such as, um, or this, yeah, this one is not that interesting, but basically we have operations such as switch on next, which means I want to switch the source pipeline if there is an issue with, uh, you know, something, uh, I count too many error, for instance. And the flow I've described below is actually an implementation of a circuit breaker just using stream operation. And that's uh, a way to deal with failures without uh, using Istrix, for instance, or installing Istrix. That's a possible way to do that. You just have to think a stream way. So what do you do of a source of stream with potential errors? So we have operations such as materialize, which transform an event into this kind of event signal, the envelope. So we know uh, this is going to be a next error or something. We have window, which is partitioning coming event feed into number of signals, so size, and then time limit, for instance. Every one second, I want to count how many elements are fading. The flat map, uh, is going to um, be the subflow for each of these partitions. So inside each of these partitions, for instance, I do use reduce uh, to accumulate a number of failures or success. Once I've accumulated these failures, I can start consuming this matrix pipeline, and that's where I take decision. So in the consume operation, I say, okay, uh, if the metrics object, which has, is open, it's actually a, a health object with is open method. When there is a too much uh, failures, we say the circuit is breaking. We are opening the circuit. And in that case, if it's open, we prepare a timer, which is a retry timeout, for instance, uh, where we're going to switch back to the source stream. But otherwise, what we are going to do is signal the switch on next operation to switch to the failure mode to go to for a fast path. And that's the kind of thing you can do when you deal with failures with uh, asynchronous programming, counting requests, um, obviously doing something if there is an issue, uh, and that's actually the plan in the next slide after this nice animation. So the plan is for um, M2 to implement all of this previous slide into the method called circuit breaker in that one, which is much shorter, you reckon. Um, and then what happens is you have all the operation already available, such as retry and retry when. This retry when is interesting because it's going to do an incremental retry uh, from one second to three seconds every time there is an exception flowing in your stream. So there are a lot of possibilities with your um, the way you handle with uh, you handle issues with uh, stream compared to try-catch. I mean, there is a kind of difference between what you do with a try-catch. You can start doing a uh, you know, uh, recursive try-catch for retry, but it doesn't really sound very good, to be honest. Uh, at least we treat as a first-class data, as a first-class citizen, um, errors and completion states, and we pass them nicely. That's what makes this operation possible. Hope this answers the question. Yep, a uh, couple more. Let's see. Um, so, what are the advantages of a, of, re, of the reactor over observable uh, created by Netflix? Is the fault yeah. tolerance mechanism is the fault tolerance mechanism comparable to Hystrix? 
So the four torrents uh, coming with each trick, uh, it's actually not necessarily only about four torrents. It's about monitoring uh, all your observable streams. Um, but the advantage of using an embedded stream over uh, each trick's deployed service um, is nearly close to nothing. And that's why we have also a specification, because if we do have to switch to Istrix, you're not locked in into using Reactor, neither you are when you use uh, Arex Java, because thanks to the specification, we can now talk each other. And that's one of the main reasons. We don't want to invent the wheel for everything, you know. Some overlap happens, of course, but Istrix is good way it is, and uh, it has its interface, etc. It does have some design choices I wouldn't really agree with, but uh, it's there and it's working really nicely. What we can offer is either an alternative, and we do offer an alternative if we implement circuit breaker like that, because that it's actually it's in line circuit breaker with Istrix. You, it's more programmatic. You have to use some of the annotation if you use Spring, for instance. Um, but at least there, it's uh, fully functional. It's implemented as part of the stream. But you know, we don't want to create um, an alternative to create an alternative. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't make sense, and that's why specification allows us to, you know, switch back between us. Um, we have our sweet point where we try to focus on, which is a Spring framework, Rabbit. Uh, we do in, we do have a story, a strong story with Spring uh, in 2015 uh, to integrate more with reactive patterns and uh, reactive streams and reactor. So 2015 is really a, a, an important year for us and for Spring as well. Um, so. You know, uh, th that specificity, the specificity we try to address um, through uh Spring ecosystem and the fact we are native implementation, uh, not a bridge, um, that's, you know, that's a sweet spot we try to perceive. And we try to create more sweet spots over time. We have stories about uh, machine learning, for instance, but that will come, you know, uh, as soon as we uh, ramp up the framework as well. Uh, last question, or no, excuse me, not the last question. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. A bunch more came in. Um, Anish asks, uh, in the case of a stream-oriented service, how is the propagation of the exception handled? Right. Um, I see. You mean, yeah, I'm going to take the example back. What it is. Um, you mean, for instance, we call another microservice, and uh, how do you handle the propagation? Well, that's a specific issue we're trying to work uh, on right now, um, because we work on the distribution story of the streams. All of these streams uh, are easily embeddable inside your JVM. You can create a stream uh, benched last time, six million times per second. It's uh, really fast. But we do need a strong distribution story, and we we are that's why we target platforms such as Spring XD for embedding us as the micro batching component uh, or the the stream component. In fact, for the module you can create for Spring XD, uh, because we do need a bridge we are working on uh, to propagate between two remote services. Uh, this event, the protocol, is not really there yet. So right now, neither of the neither of the implementation, I think, even Akastream don't implement, don't implement uh, remote translation. But you know, we work on a few of them. For instance, uh, Arex Java has a Neti Arex Neti server. Uh, I think they have some kind of bridging uh, in that case to translate an error and propagate that uh, to another stream, remote one. We work on the uh, MQP RubyMQ one. Uh, so obviously a vector for propagating as well, uh, but we need to still define things there. Uh, the important point is not necessarily to propagate the exception in that case, because in fact, do you really want to propagate? Because we're talking about cascade failure in that case. Uh, but how do you handle errors when you call something remote? What do you do? You just do a try catch and you handle that in a thread pool where you have 10 HTTP client threads, uh, or you really want to control what happens and until when, and if that happens, uh, do something else. And when it is ready, you want to pass that to your, to your producer, for instance. That really is the focus. It's more the calling the client side uh, rather than not yet 
end-to-end flow. But that's an interesting question, and we make sure we have a we make sure we have a story for that. All right, let's pick up a little speed. We've still got like four or five more questions. Um, so uh, if we use Spring Integration as an orchestration layer for microservices, will Spring Integration support Reactor? If so, do you know what features are planned? So Spring Integration story uh, for Reactor is uh, starting kicking off. Uh, there is a Reactor 1 uh, support in Spring Integration as an experiment uh, for now, but now we have evaluated where we can uh, increase or close boundary between us and, and Spring Integration. So, of course, sometimes Spring Integration has some overlap with uh, Reactor. And yeah, because we have operations such as filtering, mapping, etc. But we do not have time to redevelop all the nice connectors uh, Spring Integration has done. So with that in mind and the fact that Spring Integration team has worked uh, over a nice Java DSL, I think we can do a very nice, easy um, bridge between, uh, and in fact that's the plan and we're already discussing that internally. We can bridge integration with uh, Reactor programmatically, uh, do create, the plan is for instance to create a stream of a channel uh, or transforming um, or creating a subscriber that directly communicates to a channel. So, you know, put a, a subscriber side. So that's in a pipeline. Um, I, 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 probably that's one of the easiest paths we're trying to follow up. So it's uh, something coming soon. Awesome. Um, uh, a more shorter answer on this one. Can you give us an estimate when we might see a release from Reactor AMQP? Aha, uh -huh. uh, very nice one. <laughs> um, I tend to say like they do in Blizzard, when it is ready, no. Um, we uh, plan to release alongside uh, <laughs> alongside Reactor 2, um, which is uh, over late, overdue. Uh, M2 has been blocked by a very uh, recent issues. We did have a lot of feedbacks, and these things are complicated. Uh, I really tell you, it's, uh, it takes a lot of nights and um, obviously M2 is on its way. We should have released that by the end of this year. Uh, but M2 is on its way this week. We leave a couple of weeks for testers, and then we go on a very short RC and um, two. So December. December is the timeline for both MQP and uh, Reactor 2 GA. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, uh, almost out of questions. Uh, geez, we still have 120 people on the, on the line. Um, uh, the reactor model is normally used with HTTP. What frameworks support different models, specifically for Internet of Things applications? That's a very interesting uh, question. Uh, and and he, he clarifies yes. to say that he clarifies to say that models do not be, models equal protocols. I think. Yeah. So every time I go to, I talk to uh, to someone to, in a conference to an audience, there is someone saying, um, "Why? Uh, well, that would be great if we had a story for this thing, this thing, this thing." And that's why I say that's why it's on GitHub, and uh, we do try to find more implementation. So every time, uh, for instance, last time I went to microservice conference in Skills Matters, and there were some Erlang developers. And they were interested in creating the same alternative, uh, the same protocol uh, within Erlang, for instance, or any kind of Erlang framework. Um, so that's a plan to increase the number of protocols we understand. Actually, uh, we're working with Todd D. Montgomery, which uh, who is normally, um, uh, well, he, he works a lot around the TCP uh, protocol. But what would be interesting for us, for everyone in the industry, is to start saving resources on the network bandwidth. What do I mean by that? I mean, you don't. If we have the num the this adaptive batching provided, you know, with this flow control provided at a very low level on the TCP side, you could say, okay, this this connection is not ready yet. It doesn't have the capacity to accept more. And that's why you start doing. You start uh, having real gain in terms of resources saving because you're not going to use your bandwidth for nothing. You're, not going to, you, you, you're very reactive on the way you distribute your bandwidth, in fact. Uh, but we work on that. And, you know, as I, uh, I showed earlier, we have an MQP. Um, uh, if you go on the page, on RxJava page, page, they do have a lot of um, 
language bind as uh, binding as well. We have uh, we start the Android story as well, and one of the main users for Reactor we have is actually a startup called OpenSensor IO, uh, which is an IoT startup. And actually, it's good and bad what they did, but I tell you what. It's good because they are a great advertiser for Reactor Framework, and, and they do uh, they, they have implemented a message broker with Reactor and Netty. So uh, I, I'll, I'll link you that if you want to in the resources. It's very interesting. It's based in closure, on closure, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on uh, where you are, in the functional side. But the bad thing is they did that because they did find RockMQ not scaling enough for them in their case, in the IoT case, which I found surprising, and a lot of people found that surprising, you know. Uh, we need to have numbers when you have this kind of reference. But yep. they have this, this broker implemented uh, in Reactor and Netty. Um, actually, they are happy with that, and if they are um, if they have implemented in, 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 in Reactor, also a nice model uh, comes with that, which is a stream model. So it might be interesting to have a look. I'll uh, I'll give a link. It's a very um, it's an open source framework. Uh, two more questions. Uh, let's uh, let's try to wrap it up quick because we're almost a half hour after. Although we still have 115 people on the phone. Um, what is the key distinction between an event bus and streams? Is it that using an event bus just publishes events without a callback, while streams registers a callback? Uh, it's nearly that. In fact, it's very close to that. Uh, and there is a direct connection between a stream and uh, a stream publisher and a stream consumer. The thing is, it's more costly to use a, a bus because it, it, in Reactor case, not in general, but it's more costly to use a bus because it has to maintain a registry and it has a, a selection mechanism between consumers. When you publish an event, you publish to a topic. So the selection mechanism makes sure that these consumers actually received the event they were interested in. Um, whereas the stream is fully dedicated to your pipeline you're creating, your logic flow you're creating now, so we don't need to pick between consumers. There is only one, the next stage, or might be multiple ones if you're multicasting, but that's for the same kind of producer every time. One event bus is going to be shared. And that's the, also the limit uh, of a stream versus an event bus. When you start thinking about sharing, uh, reusing, you not you better go off with um, you better use uh, in fact an event bus rather than a stream if you think about um, shared in fact a shared event bus. But when you create for each request, what I advise is for each HTTP request you can quickly re create um, a stream. Remember five to six million uh, stream creation per second, and that is very lightweight. So you you can afford you can totally afford it for each request. And when you do that, you actually add your logic within uh, the request and return um, a stream, for instance, and you use Rapback, which understands streams. Hopefully, it wasn't so it wasn't so far away. <laughs> Another question. Still there, Sebastian? Uh, excuse me, still there, Stephane? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just uh, added uh, any sound back for the last 10 seconds. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, yeah. The, there was the question on uh, back pressure. I, we didn't hear your audio. I don't know. Maybe you did say something, but um, can you elaborate more on when back pressure will be applied to a stream? In other words, how does the stream interpret the feedback from the consumer with respect to back pressure? Right. So what happens uh, actually um, when you when you use a dot .consume operation on subscribe, the first thing it will do is request every element, every for long dot .max element. So basically the capacity of the subscriber is going to be infinite. Uh, we consider that infinite by specification. 
But uh, what happens if you don't use .consume but .subscribe and implement your own subscriber and have access to, uh, for instance, the subscription request, uh, the element you want? The thing is we have um, a subscription mechanism, mechanism we call per subscription, which will choose between pushing or uh, storing, if your consumer didn't, have, didn't ask for anything, it will store in a queue, a shared queue, which can be a Java Chronicle queue, so file persistent queue. Let me show you if I can, uh, let me zoom that. Let me show you, for instance, an example of uh, a persistent queue. Back. So, this one. Uh, reducing that. So, you can see in that example, um, I declare separately a specific queue, persistent queue spec, which is going to store on the file system and using this string codec, so it's just going to store as a string and read as a string. I create a stream, and on this stream, I attach on overflow buffer operation, and to that, I need to pass a queue, because um, if overflow means if I'm actually not, uh, if I'm producing events and the subscriber hasn't uh, asked for anything yet. So with on overflow buffer, you can customize what you want to do when that happens. And what that happens, I want to go on this disk. So you can see I'm starting, and I'm starting by consuming zero number of elements. And I'm going to broadcast a new element next. Or oh, there is a debug operation to see what happens. Uh, but the more important part is the persistent queue.size, which is a direct access to this file that space. Uh, will tell you one. Why that? Because observe and consume didn't have the capacity to accept anything. Remember, consume started with zero. But as soon as you do request more one, and actually the consume operation return um, control interface to ask for more elements. Now, if you read again the persistent queue, it's size zero. So that's the way we handle that. If we don't have capacity, we do. We we just pull over something like this persistent queue, if we have capacity, we push directly. Did you answer the question? Any follow up on that? Cool. No, I think that's it. Um, awesome. Uh, let's see. Geez, we still have 82 people. Okay, so there's one more question, just so that I don't um, leave this poor guy hanging. Um, and then chop, chop, chop him off. Um, Eric Rubal asks, uh, perhaps this was answered, but it wasn't clear to me. Will Hystrix command be converted from Rx Java observable responses to Reactor? Um, does Hystrix... Da, 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 da. So, give, uh, give me it again. I think uh, I need to... No, no problem. No, no problem. Will the Hystrix command be converted yeah. from RX Java, uh, RX Java observable responses to Reactor? Maybe he um, worded that. Yeah, interesting. Um, so it could be if you annotate your service method uh, with a Istrix command, but instead of returning uh, a, um, the object, for instance, you return a stream, uh, an observable, sorry, and you map this observable uh, to a stream using the RX bridge, RX uh, reactive streams bridge. To, that's what happens today. Tomorrow, what we're going to do is directly make sure that Spring understands the return type of stream, even with a strict command, and directly map into a stream, which makes things much easier to uh, implement. And that's a really, really near goal term. Awesome. All right. Well, we are officially at an hour and a half. <laughs> Wow, this is amazing. Um, I, thank you, Stéphane. Uh, already a bunch of great comments. Some thanks from from folks. And uh, oh, yeah, um, just an amazing, you know, uh, attend rate on this one. You know, thirty six percent, which is 
just incredibly high. So, you know, usually it's about 20% that, that, that attend. So um, clearly a lot of interest in this topic. That's great. Just want to let people know that uh, we are recording the webinar. It will be posted to the spring, spring.io forward slash video and spring.io forward slash blog uh, within the next two weeks. And um, we always upload our, our PowerPoints to speaker deck. Um, so um, Stefan, as soon as you send me the link to the uh, speaker deck, talk, uh, slides, excuse me, yeah. uh, we'll uh, get the YouTube replay rendered and you'll see that published. Um, uh, and if you could just pull up your uh, summary slide on, on where to go to get Reactor uh, yeah. at the end of your presentation, that'd be great. So um, yeah, uh, please download it, uh, try it out. I think, um, uh, let's see, As a right in there, point, there we go. The block is very, very important. Uh, it explains Currently, without using too much buzzword, uh, where we are, where we go, and some examples, interesting examples, plus some links with some demo we uh, we have around. Yep, um, and I think you're going to be seeing more from Stefan and John Brisbane and the, and this team in general as uh, as we believe that uh, uh, reactive programming and asynchronous sort of I.O. Is, is a very important element of microservice architecture. So thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, and, uh, yeah, go try it out on Maven Central. Give us some feedback on Twitter um, or in JIRA or whatever works for you. And um, hope to see you at the next webinar. Check the spring.io uh, forward slash blog. Uh, we've just put up some, some new webinars uh, a few minutes ago. So we've got some... Uh, January webinars on the Spring Integration DSL. Uh, that's the thing John was talking about a, a little while ago uh, in response to that gentleman's questions on Spring Integration. Uh, and then um, there's another webinar on Spring Data Gemfire uh, in January. So just check the Spring I.O. blog and register and join up. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Stefan, thank you so much. Anything you want to say before we get going? No, thank you so much for uh, for inviting me and talking about this topic. I do believe it's a very important topic, and uh, everyone should at least know what we're talking about. And um, thank you, everyone, for attending that one. Hopefully, my accent wasn't too strong. Uh, if it was, <laughs> uh, just uh, blast me on Twitter. I love Twitter trolls. Yep, yep. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a great week. Take care. Thank you.